be the moderator. And I would just like to take a little bit to introduce our speakers. Again, thank you for the honor for speaking with us today. And uh, we have Rabab Abdul Hadi, and she's a founder, founding director, and senior scholar of the Arab and Muslim ethnicities, ethnicities and diaspora studies program, and an associate professor of ethnic studies and affiliated faculty in sexuality studies at San Francisco State University. Uh, before joining San Francisco State University, she served as the first director of the Center for Arab American Studies at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, uh, a co-founding editorial board member of Islamophobia Studies Journal. She has published over 80 articles and book chapters in seven languages in academic, print, and social media. She's the lead editor of several anthologies. And as well, Dr. Haydar Aid. Associate Professor of Postcolonial and Postmodern Literature at the Gaza Al Aqsa University in Palestine. He has published papers on cultural studies and literature in a number of journals, journals and books. He has also written widely in, on the Arab Israeli conflict. He is a policy advisor, advisor with Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and on, on, and on the advisory board of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. His books are Worlding Postmodernism, Interruptive Possibilities of Critical Theory, and Countering the Nakba, One State for All. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have Ismail Khaldi, born in Beirut to Palestinian parents and raised in Chicago. Ismail Khaldi is a playwright, screenwriter, and director. Khaldi's plays, plays include Truth Serum Blues, uh, Benjia World Theater, Ten Tennis in Nablus, Alliance Theater, Theater, uh, Foot, Sebra Falling, and uh, Dead Are My People. He co-adopted two novels for the stage with Naomi Wallace, so the San Canafani's returning to Haifa, which we, we will focus on today as well, um, and Sinan Antunes, A Corpse Washer. Uh, Khali's work has been published in numerous anthologies, and he co-edited Inside Outside, Six Plays from Palestine and the Diaspora. His writing has been featured in American Theater Magazine, the Kenyon Review, The Nation, Mizna, Guernica, Guernica, Al Jazeera, uh, the dramatist and Ramezkla Khaldi holds an MFA from NYU's Desk School of the Arts and is currently a directing fellow at Bangia World Theater. Um, and just a little note, Dr. Dr. Haider Aid is speaking currently from Gaza and he might have some connectivity issues. So, uh, we, we have to bear that in mind again. Um, and I will hand it off to Saham, our ex the executive director of the Jerusalem Fund. Uh, and you can go ahead, Saham. So thank you, Firas. And on behalf of the Jerusalem Fund, I would like to uh, first thank our speakers, Professor Abdul Hadi, Aid, and Ismail for joining us today for this important event. As many of you know, Rasen Kanafani was a Palestinian political thinker, intellectual, and journalist, a liberation movement activist who was assassinated along with his niece, Lamis Najem, by the Israeli Mossad in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, on July 8, 1972. Kenefani's publications include Men in the Sun, All That's Left to You, Om Saad, Returning to Haifa, as well as short fiction um, such as Letters to Gaza, The Land of Sad Oranges. And he was all, also editor and contributor to different newspapers and magazines, including Al Rai, Al Hurriya, Al Muharrir, Al Anwar. Uh, El Hadaf and Lotus. Uh, Kenafani's work has been translated into 18 languages, including English. And our three expert speakers will provide historical, political, and li literary context to the life and works of Kenafani. But before that, today's celebration of the life and works of Hassan Kenafani, they interlink. It interlinks with two of the Jerusalem Fund's programs. First, the Palestine Center, which is an educational program committed to communicating reliable and objective information about the Palestinian political experience 
to American policymakers, students, journalists, and the public and the general public through conferences, panel discussions, lectures, and other events. And our Palestine Center also includes the Hisham Sharabi Memorial Library that has over 3,000 texts on the Palestinian struggle, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, Palestinian society, Zionism, and Arab history, society, and culture. And our second program, Gallery al Quds, which is our culture program, which showcases the rich uh, and national heritage of the Palestinian people and surrounding Arab societies through art and photography exhibit, uh, exhibits, film screenings, musical performances, among others. We also have a third program, the Humanitarian Link, and through that program, we provide grants to um, education and community development programs um, in the Middle East. And we also help sustain the only specialized diabetes centers uh, in Elbira, Nablus, and El Khalid. And to learn more about our mission and programs, you can subscribe to our website and social media sites. And on a final note, we will have our first in-person uh, event uh, since the pandemic um, in November, and that will be our annual conference. So please, you know, uh, you know, keep updated through our website and social media sites. And now, without further ado, I will give the floor to Professor Abdel Hadi. Um, yes. Thank you so much. I begin by first acknowledging that my university, San Francisco State University, sits on stolen, unceded indigenous people's land of the Ohlone Nation. And I am currently on the East Coast of the United States on the indigenous stolen land of the Lenape Nation. And uh, it's very important for us as Palestinians to continue to acknowledge that. Uh, given also that one and anybody who comes to Palestine, we would want them to acknowledge. Secondly, I want to uh, acknowledge the fallen. And I begin with Rassan Kenefani, who's uh, the anniversary of his martyrdom is tomorrow. But uh, as uh, Al-Hakim Raj Habash always said, the Volunir series never die. And the in amount of the events and the commemorations and the celebrations and the life of Ghassan Kenafani lives on again and again in defiance of colonial, colonial uh, assassination, physical violence, epistemological violence, and all sorts of violences. I also want to be remiss if I don't mention also the other people who have fallen that Ghassan Kenafani's life brings uh, to our attention. Uh, the most, be probably closer, is Shirin Abu Akle, who as a journalist also was assassinated by Israel. Uh, Israel claims this unintentionally, but there is nothing unintentional, nothing random in war. And as well as the many uh, victims who have been fallen recently to racist violence, white supremacist violence, whether we're talking about the recent Hyde Park in the suburb of Chicago, or none other than the anniversary of the celebration of the foundation of the U.S. settler colonial state, 1772, July 4th, as well as the recent massacres in Buffalo, in, in, in Texas and elsewhere around the world, and the many people who have fallen victim. And I think it's really important for us to think about that because that connects the violence, the violence, the state, the structural mm -hmm. violence against it, about which Hassan Kanafani spoke and for which he gave his life. So this is really important for us to think about that. The, so the, and, and why was Hassan Kanafani killed? And I think I'm just uh, basic, I think some of the issues I'm bringing up is something that we share, all our, our panelists, that is shared by people around the world who are remembering. There have been many rememberings every single year since Hassan Kenafani was uh, assassinated. And actually, one of my colleagues just sent me a poster that was created by the Hassan Kenafani Cultural Association, not in Beirut, in New York, in Arabic, a uh, poster. So I just, I'm trying to actually put all these uh, posters together and maybe hopefully the Palestine Center Jerusalem Football will want to do maybe an exhibition and just find all these uh, uh, rare um, and, and not so rare and put them together. As you know, uh, behind me, an embroidery 
that is Ghassan Kanafani's, uh, this is one of his, uh, his art because Ghassan Kanafani was also Fanan Tashkili. He was an artist, illustrative artist. But this piece, I actually bought it from the old city of Nablus from a Palestinian guy who's actually a carpenter in his usual life. And then whenever he has time, he, he engages in art and so on. And it also shows how art can be part of everybody's life. So why was Ghassan Kanafani killed and what does Ghassan Kanafani represent? Let me start first by the Ghassan Kanafani born in Akka, born and raised in Akka. And let's understand what Akka was. Akka was the, the, the city that defied Napoleon, that defeated Napoleon. And so there is a, this past year, the French uh, colonial state that claims to be civilized state has celebrated Napoleon, but Napoleon was defeated in Akka. Akka is the place where uh, from the prison of Akka, the funeral, the, 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 the funeral for the three Palestinian martyrs, Fuad Hijazi, Atas Zero, Mahmoud Hijazi, Atas. Okay, now I'm, I, I, it's in my notes, I'm speaking of the. Mohammed Jamjum, Fuad. Mohammed Jamjum, Fuad Hijazi, Atas Zero, the three. Uh, their funeral actually moved from Akka's prison, British, under British colonialism, uh, to be, and they are buried in Akka's uh, cemetery. And in our visit to Akka in 2018, actually during the Teaching Palestine uh, conferences that we conducted with Birzit and al Najah, and we had a delegation, one of the uh, organizers took us to the, to the martyrs' prisons that were rehabilitated and made to honor these prisoners from Akka. This is where, where Hassan Kinefani comes from. He was born on April 9th, 1936, actually the year where the 1936-39 revolt began, which al Ghassan Kinefani actually provided one of the best analysis. Uh, my colleague, I'm sure, Haidar, and uh, uh, my uh, colleague also, Ismail, will talk about the cultural and literary aspects. This is not my area. I'm, 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 I'm a scholar of Palestine history, and I'm also an activist. Uh, um, uh, in, in Palestine and so on. But to me, the fact that he was born on April 9th, the, the anniversary of the Deir Yassin massacre uh, in 1948, and also uh, the birthday of uh, Leila Khaled, who has, is connected very much with Ghassan Kanafani. And Ghassan Kanafani was the spokesperson in, uh, in, in uh, defying the international media and so on, which we can talk about that later on. And the reason I mentioned Leila Khaled is because hosting Leila Khaled two years ago, trying to host Slayla Khalid in one of our open classrooms has actually brought the wrath of the Zionists to also silence in a way that uh, uh, Shirin Abu Akri was silenced by a bullet. Ghassan Kanafani was silenced by an explosion in his car. And our own uh, speaking up for Palestine has been silenced. Why Ghassan Kanafani? Ghassan Kanafani never carried a gun. Ghassan Kanafani always said, Al Kalim al Bundukiya, my word is the gun. Ghassan Kanafali always advocated discursive and spoke about defied the discursive colonial narratives of submission, subjugation, and defeat, and instead basically proposed narratives of resistance, resilience, and uh, uh, steadfastness. We see that very clearly in the very famous interview that I'm sure probably everybody who clicks on Ghassan Kanafali on YouTube will find it with the uh, reporter from another settler colony, Australia, who actually questioned Ghassan Kanafani and asks him these stupid questions that I, I think they are, probably today we find them stupid, but at the time for quote unquote mainstream and international relations and uh, talk heads and so on, seemed very important. He said, why would you not you have peace? And Kanafani says, peace for what? And he said, for whatever. And you said, what do you mean for whatever? Whatever does not mean anything. You have to basically talk about having things contextualized. He's talking about dialectical and historical materialism. What does this mean? And he said, talk. Ghassan Kenefin says, to whom? And he says, talk. And Ghassan Kenefin says, about what? And he said, about peace. And said, peace for what? So Ghassan Kenefin is challenging discursively the framing of colonial narratives and actually presenting how is it that we can challenge every single thing, i.e. do not accept anything that is given to us the definition of the situation, the, 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 the terms of the battle, everything that is not actually up to us, it's not, and I'm saying up to us, I'm talking about the people who are colonized, the people who are rising and trying to speak up for ourselves as colonized, for ourselves as, uh, as, uh, as, as, as part of 
um, colonized people around the world, marginalized people around the world, Palestinians as well. But every single time, Ghassan Kenafani is challenging that and actually alerting us from Ghassan Kenafani to Ani So This is really important for the work, for example, that we do when we say teaching Palestine pedagogical praxis. It means that pedagogical praxis, people only know about Paulo Freire, for example. Sometimes they think about Amilcar Cabral, but they don't really think about other contexts in which probably the medium is not English or the material has not been made accessible because Amilcar Cabral wrote in Portuguese and so did Paulo Freire, but it became accessible to uh, uh, audiences who, who were the medium of, of uh, communication the medium of uh, uh, relating people to each other is English, which is a colonial imperialist language, which actually dictates not only the lack even of interpretation, the lack of uh, uh, translation, so on, because we can't even find all the words that we need to translate or we need to translate, but also it imposes certain ways of how knowledge is being produced, how knowledge is being transmitted, and which knowledge is valued and so on. And I'm not here under undermining the amazing work Pablo Freire and the Freirean uh, knowledge and the Freire analysis came up, nor Amilcar Cabral, nor Franz Fanon, who also spoke about basically challenge internalized colonialism and so on. And, I'm, and now I'm also not, not going into the, the literary thing. I'm speaking about the anti-colonial literature. And I so hate, hate it when we say post-colonial because colonialism has not happened, has not ended. And it's, is it post-colonialism after colonialism happened? So is colonialism the center? of our analysis, or are we actually centering our analysis on the people of, or upon whom's lives we need to talk? And so on, which Ghassan Kenafani made that clearly again and again and again. So in that sense, Ghassan Kenafani was also challenging. What is knowledge all about and how knowledge is all about? And actually one of the interviews that were conducted by Al Hadaf, the magazine that Ghassan Kenafani created, which was, and I, uh, there is certain, I wrote uh, for Al Hadaf, and I'm very proud to have been one of the people who had written to the same journal that Ghassan Kanafani founded. Uh, I, I did not know many things that Ghassan, uh, Ken, Ghassan Kanafani created Al Hadaf like a tabloid. It was the first time there was a tabloid in the Arab world. It was 70 pages. I mean, imagine 70 pages. People now complain if you give them a couple of words and say, make the message much shorter. If not 140 characters that fit on, on Twitter or not, do not use it. And we're and, and in that, challenging the literature, the culture, the opposite, opposite viewpoints, the discussions that were, was, was included in Al-Hadaf and so on, it was something that everybody read. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but one of the former managing editors of Al-Hadaf spoke at one of the events saying that uh, Al-Hadaf did not have a sponsorship because there was a debate whether you want to take money from financiers in order to do it, which is always the everlasting dilemma. In, 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 in our uh, engagement and so on, or do you want to uh, self-subsidize? Uh, and actually, one of the people said that the subscriptions from Arab students in the United States, and this concerns us, and I would assume through the Organization of Arab Students, which was very, very historic, lost, lasted a very long time, and has been one of the uh, uh, foundations, uh, that and the Arab American University graduates and the various community centers, women's groups, students, et cetera, et cetera. He, the, the guy said that actually his name Hani Habib. He said that if you uh, the, the the subscriptions from students sometimes could actually pay for all al hadaf. Of course, understanding that even the salaries of the people who were working and so on were pretty minor and so on. So that's one one big aspect of it. The second aspect of it is Kenafani always spoke about al haqiqa kull al haqiqa lil jamahir. The slogan was truth, the whole truth to the masses. And for me, as somebody who actually would like to get, engage a little bit more of a critical theory, and especially today because critical race theory in particular, and critical theory in general is being under attack by white supremacists, right-wingers, corporatization, neoliberalism, and so on, as well, of course, the Zionists are big, play a big part of it because they'd like to silence, they'd like to have, not have people think, understand, learn, because when people think, understand, and learn, as we know today in the United States, even in the United States, there is much more support for Palestine and understanding what justice in for Palestine means. I want, so what does that mean? And who are the Who is the audience? Are we speaking about the audience as uh, everybody? Is the audience everybody? When you write something in a newspaper, that's it. That, that you no longer own 
the words that you write. They can be used by anybody who take them up and put them out. Are, are they, but he, when he was saying Lil Jamahir, he meant the masses, the Palestinian grassroots masses, the Arab grassroots, the international, the people who are actually see Palestine as a project of liberation. They may not be Palestinians themselves, but for them, Palestine is a project of liberation. And they saw that and so on. So today, when we even speak about that, and maybe we can talk about it a little bit later, but I think in even our scholarship and our research and so on, what does it mean? What kind of knowledge you receive and what kind of knowledge you actually are able to share or can share? And what responsibility does the scholar and the researcher have when we are doing, we're producing our own knowledge? Do we actually, everything we do, we just put it out there because we are in a way uh, um, accommodating ourselves to the, uh, to the corporate media dictum of the scoop. We're putting things out there in order to sell more newspaper, uh, uh, more newspapers, and to sell to get more ads on the on the websites and so on, such as Facebook and uh, or anyone else that are using it today. Or are you actually being very responsible and understanding what do you do with the information? And if we have time, maybe we can speak about even the ways into which Palestinian prisoners have been able to kind of like um, uh, um, transfer or transmit the knowledge from inside the prisons to outside the prisons to, to within the prison itself to various people who were in prison organizing in prison and to people outside this is supporters including to supporters elsewhere like Yaqub Ode and others letter to Angela Davis and so on it's not our discussion but I think this is really an important point to talk about that another point it's really important to talk about that is was Ghaskan Kanifani a public intellectual or an organic intellectual and I want to stress that Hassan Kanafani was an organic intellectual in the sense of uh, Gramsci, in the ways Gramsci explained what an organic intellectual is. An organic intellectual is an intellectual who's tied to the people's causes, to the people's masses, who is advocating for what people need for their own struggles, who's speaking up for them, but he's also accountable to them. Doesn't speak up by himself. He is, he's an artist, he's creative. There is a lim there is a, there needs to be unlimited ability for the artists and the writers to create and so on. But he was a, pub, a, a organic intellectual. Public intellectual is an intellectual who engages the public, who can write in newspapers, who can come on TV, who can actually give interviews and so on, which is fine. And I think we do need that for sure. But Ghassan Kanafani went beyond that. And this takes me to the point of why was he killed? He never carried a gun. Israel always claimed that it's quote unquote, it's security is about the people, quote unquote, whose hands are carried with, with blood. The question is, is that was Ghassan Kenafani hands carried in blood? Ghassan Kenafani, again, never carried the gun, but Ghassan Kenafani's words, Al-Kalima al bundukiya were so dangerous that Israel did to the Palestinians. But before him, it was Kamal Nasser, Kamal Udwan, Abu Yusuf al-Najjar, it was Ghassan Kenafani, Abu Jihad, uh, Abu Yad, Majid Abu Sharar, Wa'il Zaytar. There is so many in our own context, and we can also think of our context. In South Africa, for example, the assassination of Louis I, who was one of the leading communists in the South African Communist Party in the African National Congress and so on. We can think about the ways in which the US killed uh, Albizu Campos, who was a leader of the Nationalist Party in Puerto Rico, in prison. Now we know, for example, then when we didn't know at the time that Tawfiq, uh, Tawfiq, uh, uh, um, Haddad was also was also killed in, 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 in prison as well through the chocolate. Okay. We do not know what happened to Franz Fanon, who died at the very early age, but we also know about the Black Panthers and we know about the program in the United States. It's very relevant to our people in the US, the counter pro, pro counterintelligence program by which the United States, the FBI, and the CIA went and plucked the leaders of the Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, Chicano Chicana Movement, Puerto Rican Movement, anti-colonial uh, white uh, uh, oppositional uh, figures and so on, the same way in which they collaborated in 1973 with the CIA and the fascist junta in, Brazil, in, in, in Chile and killed Salvador Allende. So I think it's really important to think about that and who was at the head of killing Ghassan Kanafani? Golda Meir, was the one who was the prime minister who is hailed, unfortunately, 
as the feminist prime minister of Israel is the one who, who authorized it. And it was very uh, ironic when we were at the National Women's Studies Association in Milwaukee, where we actually passed the resolution for to support Palestine, to support BDS, to support boycott, to say Palestine is a feminist issue, that there were many rooms in the hotel named after um, Golda Meir. One of the leading of the squad was Ehud Barak, so who became the Israeli uh, uh, prime minister. And so the reason I'm saying this is this was happening at the highest levels. This was not, again, this was not a coincidental, this not, was not a random thing. This was not and defies the Israeli narrative and the Israeli claims the way they say today, Shireen Abu Akhle was a stray bullet. We know it was a sniper. We know that it was a very well, well uh, 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 known bullet. We know that Israeli supporters are actually interested and, and intent on extinguishing any kind of knowledge, defying Palestinian narratives, defying Palestinian relationship to their land, trying to erase Palestine. We do know that that has failed. We know that the Zionist project has failed. That the, in that sense, the Zionist project has failed to establish itself as a land without people for a people without a land. It doesn't work anymore. I mean, they can try all they want, it doesn't work. Not only that we achieved more that Zionism is called apartheid and so on, but that's not we can talk about that later on. But the, the question is that, is that it was always about trying the Israeli machine has historically been very much interested in PR, in their public image and their standing among the world as much as they were interested in so-called quote unquote security for guns and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we just witnessed the 20th anniversary of the beginning of the apartheid wall that they said they want to build it so the Palestinians couldn't get through. But then the, a lot of the places of the wall has not been built in order for Israel to allow Palestinian workers to go work for cheap labor, slave labor inside. So, I mean, all these tales that they come up with actually don't work. And in them, the whole question of uh, Ghassan Kenafani comes in. I want to just end, and I think time is up. I just want to uh, end on, the, on, on uh, to come back to the whole question of uh, uh, how do we tell the narratives and whose narratives we tell and how do we speak about them and how do we frame Palestine? Palestine, as Ghassan Kenafani spoke about it, and actually there's a lot of saying uh, for him and a lot of saying about him by people that Ghassan Kenafani is so Palestine, so justice in for Palestine, actually spoke about justice for Palestine. He's even in that interview, there's this nasty interview with Carleton from Australia. He spoke about justice for Palestine, justice in for Palestine as part and part of the indivisibility of justice. Palestine is not a cause owned by the Palestinian. Palestine is a cause for anybody who supports justice and Palestine, justice in for Palestine can never ever be divided and separated from any other justices for any other people who are coming in the, 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 the forces that are repressing us are actually employing similar and read the same books and so on. I am not suggesting that our struggles are all similar. We cannot conflate them. But there is a shared sense of justices and there is a shared sense of internationalism, international solidarities that brings us together, that makes Ghassan Kenafani a figure in all internationalist movements seeking freedom justice, liberation, and peace on the basis of dignity and freedom as any other heroes and uh, sheroes and the collective struggle in which we don't know all the names, but everybody contributes to the indivisibility of justice and to a free Palestine. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you, and, and thank you very much for ending on that point, uh, Professor Abdul Hadi. I think it's very important, Yanis, a lot of what you mentioned is so vital, and I think it will now interconnect with what Professor uh, Aid will talk about. But I think, you know, silencing voices continues to be, whether it's, you know, writers, activists, uh, journalists, just like uh, Shireen Abu Akla, because these are individuals who are sharing the narrative, who are sharing the truth and the truth to the masses. Um, whether it's through, like I said, behind the camera, or whether it's using the pen, you know, to write a book or to write an article. Um, and, you know, and this is why for us, 
you know, when we say this is writing and l literary works, uh, and you know, Hassan Kanafani's work is again, it's this is why it's it's coined, it's been coined resistance literature. And I think with this, we will now jump to um, Professor Haydar Eid. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abdul Hadi. Um, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Siham. And and let me start by I mean thanking the Jerusalem Fund and uh, Palestine Center for organizing um, this important event in celebrating Hassan Kanafani on the 50th anniversary of his assassination. Um, I am personally indebted to Kanafani for um, you know the role played by his literature and political writings in in shaping my own consciousness. And it's an honor, of course, to be sharing this platform with uh, uh, Professor Abab Abdel Hadi and and Ismail Al Khalidi. So thank you. And let me let me open. Um, you know, um, I'll take a different perspective from uh, different uh, different perspective from Dr. Uh, Rabab's uh, you know take on Kanafani. And and I want to open with a question: uh, whether there is anything left that has not been said or written in Arabic in Arabic about Hassan Kanafani. And, and I want to give a title uh, to my talk here. And I want to say, and I want to call it, you know, Hassan Kanafani and the inexhaustible dialectic in, in an attempt to, uh, you know, answer this question. Um, so the question in different words is whether his literature is exhaustible or inexhaustible. Um, can one write about Hassan Kanafani or talk about Ghassan Kanafani under the current conditions with the same optimism that led, for example, you know, the late Egyptian uh, f founder of modern Arabic uh, short story, Yusuf Idris, for example, in his famous introduction to Ghassan Kanafani's short stories, um, when he asked, um, when he, uh, you know, when he asked us Palestinians to hold to Kanafani's short stories and literature, like holding to our Quran. And he, that, that's the word he used, um, Samah Idris, uh, sorry, <laughs> Samah Idris, uh, Yusuf Idris. I mean, and put differently, where does Kanafani fit within the new intellectual scene after the retreat, and that's what Dr. Rabab was talking about, after the retreat of most of you know, radical intellectuals here in the, Arab, in the Arab world. What would he as a Fanonian native intellectual have done had he still been alive? And, and I think this is one of the questions that we are going to be addressing after, um, you know, after the talk. Um, how would the writer of Men in the Sun have reacted after his men in the sun have been asked to stop banging the walls of the tank in the 1990s, especially in 1993 with the signing of the Oslo Accords. Uh, instead of, you know, and now what we have ended up as, you know, Hassan Kanafani's men, men in the sun, we have ended up fighting for, you know, extra percentages of um, our homeland. Um, generally speaking, you know, uh, the relationship between the inhuman exploitation and persecution of the of the Palestinians and our ideas and social values was powerfully expressed in a narrative form almost for the first time in Ghassan Kanafani's novels. I mean, mind you, Men in the Sun was written in the you know the late 50s, almost 1958. Um, and therefore, a correct understanding of Ghassan Kanafani's novels, and I'm referring now to Ghassan Kanafani's novels because this is what I'm teaching. This is part of, you know, my field of study. And I have ended up concluding that a correct understanding of, uh, of his novels requires an understanding of the Palestinians' past and their present. You know, that is to say, Kanafani's realism has the ability not only to reflect our reality as uh, you know George Lukacs would have put it, uh, but also moves us readers into a new order of perception and experience. This is why I love Ghassan Kanafani. This is why we Palestinians love Ghassan Kanafani, the writer, the writer, the novelist. Um, um, and this is why 
um, I have been always saying that Ghassan Kanathani does not only defamiliarize, but also confronts our reality. And this is why we love Ghassan Kanathani. And this is why we always say that, you know, his, his literature has complicated themes and questions. Those complicated themes and questions recur throughout Ghassan Kanathani's, um, Ghassan Kanathani's literature. Exile, death, and history, you know, a combination of exile, death, and history, almost in every single piece of his writings, you have that. And such questions are indeed related to the role Kanafani himself, as, as Rabab has just said, Kanafani himself as a politically committed writer, you know, these ideas reveal the weakness of some Palestinians like in Men in the Sun um, in, in preferring the search for material security to the fight to regain their land, Men in the Sun. Uh, the responsibility of the Palestinian leadership, Abu al-Khaizaran, in allowing Palestinians to suffocate in the marginal world of refugee camps is amazingly amazingly foreseen by Kanafani. As, as, as uh, the Palestinian critic, uh, Rabab, you know, Faisal Darraj notices, uh, the world of Kanafani, uh, Kanafani is different as, um, as, as a different Palestinian, you know, world. So we have different Palestinian characters uh, as a composite of a poetic and organic relationship with the land. If you look at you know, his unfinished work, The Lover, if you look at Men in the Sun, if you look at that, um, at all that is left to you, if you look at The Land of Sad Oranges, you have that poetic and organic relationship between the Palestinian on the one hand and the land on the other hand. So being separated from the land, um, uh, you know, like in the land of sad oranges, like in Men of the Sun, and seeking individualistic solutions leads the Men in the Sun in general to be to, to an undignified tragic death. That's the end of Men in the Sun. And that is to say, Kenafani at the time had the ability to explore the dialectical relationship between the inward and the outward realities of the colonized Palestinian. Uh, the world of all that is left to you, Matabakalakum, for example, is a world of socio-political paralysis that needs to open up new possibilities for um, a better future. Hence the open ending of all that is left to you. A fact, which is a fact that and again, like Men in the Sun and Returning to Haifa and the Land of Sad Oranges takes 1948, the year of the Rakba, the, the Palestinian catastrophe, as the emerging center and the frozen Palestinian image. Historical consciousness is reached in Ghassan Kanafani through individual and collective transformation and real meaningful time is reached through action. Of course, um, in order to reach um, you know, historical uh, consciousness, one must get rid um, of false consciousness. That is a precondition for reaching historical consciousness. Um, as I said, all um, that is left to you is open-ended because it is about, as Edward Said would have put it, it is about beginnings rather than endings, uh, about a non-ending dialectical process. Hence, with the optimistic ending of all that is left to you and the call for social revolution in Men in the Sun, one concludes that history can never be closed, whether Fukuyama likes it or not. In Ghassan Kanafani, history can never be closed. The role of the engaged intellectual that Rabab was talking about um, um, in his, you know, in his battle to restore historical continuity after tragic events like like the Nakba, is Edward Said said that role is to guarantee 
survival to what was imminent danger of extinction. That's us Palestinian. And that was expressed very well in Hassan Kanafani's uh, literature. So Kanafani's stories of the struggle of men and women to free Palestinian men and, men and women in particular to free themselves from certain inhuman forms of oppression and persecution are undoubtedly related to the ideas, values, and feelings by which those men and women, especially Palestinians, experience their society and their existential, political, and historical situation. I think this is, this is extremely important for us to understand the context within which Ghassan Kanafani's literature uh, was, was, was written. Uh, this is to say, to understand Kanafani's ideological orientation and commitment is to understand both the past of the Palestinian, Palestinians and their present more deeply, and understanding that contributes to our liberation. Um, in other words, Kanafani's literature has a great artistic influence that emerges from a confrontation with reality rather than an attempt to escape from it. To repeat, I think it's important to emphasize the importance of those themes that Hassan Kanafani kept on repeating, exile, death, and history. And these themes are what Men in the Sun, the novel, tries to answer. Questions that Kanafani asks and helps us as readers and as Palestinians to answer. I think um, Kanafani as a writer was not only a Palestinian refugee placed in history responding to a general, you know, to a general history from his own particular standpoint, making sense of it in his own concrete terms. What he also had at his disposal is an ideological perspective, an ideological perspective. And this is, I mean, we cannot deny it. It's very clear. It's an ideological perspective that helped him to penetrate to the realities, penetrate the realities of men and women's experience in specific historical and political situations. And this is why I decided to teach Ghassan Kanafani's literature to my South African students. And I decided to teach his literature to my Chinese students when I was on a sabbatical for a year in China as well. But what is important for us Palestinians is to look at his self-critique of some negative Palestinian practices. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, Abu al-Khaizaran in Men in the Sun. I'm thinking about, you know, those individualistic solutions that Men in the Sun, you know, were fighting for. And, and uh, his self-critique uh, reflects, I would say, a kind of not only national, nationalistic, but also historical consciousness that Palestinians and all colonized peoples, I would say, are in a position to do something about their own present and future. And this is why my South African, you know, students loved Ghassan Kanafani's literature. You know, I'm also thinking within this context, and I'm glad that Rabat mentioned it, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, like-minded thinkers and activists, Franz Fanon, Amy Cesare, Amilcar Cabral, Steve Biko, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that's what helped me understand Hassan Kanafani more. Uh, you know, the Western Enlightenment Enlightenment project cannot be comprehended without a historical understanding of the development of capitalism and its inhuman manifestation in colonialism. Uh, from the industrial till you know the post-industrial stage, which is a stage at which there is Unfortunately, as we know, because of colonialism, there is no place for so-called third world peoples, according to some post-colonial intellectuals. And I'm thinking about, you know, the Asnaipul here, you know, the Asnaipul. There is no place for third, when, when the Asnaipul was asked about the future of Africa, directly he said, 
Africa has no future. Africa has no future. And therefore we should think of dreaming of liberation. And that's, that's the, op the, you know, the opposite of the ending of, you know, all that is left to you and men in the sun, uh, or that um, the land of sad oranges returning to Haifa, et cetera, et cetera. However, I think the challenge presented by the victories of a series of national liberation movements as a whole after uh, Second World War is a factor which supports Ghassan Kanafani's, Franz Fanon's, Amilcar Cabral's call for a radical solution. A radical solution. Uh, Kanafani offers the alternative. And this is the point, exactly like Franz Fanon, exactly like uh, Steve Biko, like Amilcar Cabral. Kenafani offers the alternative that takes social and historical objective conditions into account, which is also an alternative that asks the men in the sun, or rather the colonized in general, to depend on their powers in, in, in their relentless struggle against the existing or order with all its injustice and the hegemony that the imperialist project asserts over the developing world. Uh, this is why we have a very violent action at the end of all that is left to you. A violent action in the, in the Fanonian sense of the word, in the Fanonian sense of the word. I mean, what the, the protagonist of all that is left to you and his sister do at the end of all that is left to you. Uh, by the way, when it was made into a movie, it was given, you know, the title was a sikin, you know, the knife. And that, you know, proves my point about that Fanonian dimension. When the colonizer and the colonized meet, I mean, the inevitable takes place, violence. Colonialism itself is the original sin, and it's a very violent sin. Um, Hamid, the hero, the protagonist of All That Is Left To You, is an oppressed Palestinian who is searching for his land, searching for history, searching for identity, which are restored through his struggle to regain his land and his identity. So the true center of All That Is Left To You, for example, is not only Hamid's violent action uh, or absence of his action, but also the real conditions of settler colonialism, apartheid and occupation. Those are the conditions that are responsible for the loss of the land, for the loss of Yafa, for the loss of Palestine. We readers, uh, you know, throughout reading this novel, for example, are directed toward an examination of the conditions of persecution and war responsible for the Nakba, responsible for the tragedy, responsible for the disaster. And it is Hamid's behavior, the protagonist's behavior uh, itself that we are invited to scrutinize. These are events which um, affect Hamid's, the Palestinian's character, my character, your characters, uh, your personality. And the result is the action in all that is left to you that took place in 1964 with Hamid's resistance. In 1965, it was the emergence of the contemporary Palestinian revolution. All that is left, for example, at the end of all that is left to you are beats, beats, beats. You know, not banging the walls of the tank, but we have beats, uh, beats which throughout the text reveal forms of full consciousness at the beginning, and then witness the Palestinians' transformation and emancipation at the end of the novel. All that is left are the beats which end and overcome the paralysis like the paralysis we had after 1993 with the signing of the Oslo, the Oslo Accords, spread of false consciousness, unfortunately. All that is left at the end of the novel, and this is what we have right now with the Unity Intifada, with what happened in Gaza, with the, with the BDS movement, is, you know, um, conscious historical uh, um, um, action. And I want to end up with, uh, you know, just mentioning that, you know, such novels, 
Nasan Kanafani's novels, could be said to have called, and this is why they are important, called into question the illusion through which the Zionist bourgeois false, uh, falsely represented to itself and to the West its colonizing vet ventures as part of a mythical historic mission undertaken on the part of the Jews and even on behalf of humanity. Now, Kanafani's revolutionary literary works draw attention to that part of humanity that is excluded from the Zionist imperialistic equation, the native Palestinians. And this is probably why they decided to assassinate Ghassan Kanafani. This is the reality which Kanafani's literature manages to reflect. It is a social and historical reality with a dialectical shape. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Professor Eid. And I think that's a perfect way to end. And I think what's so important, like you said, is, you know, <clears throat> our past is our present. Um, and this is why, um, Yani, through, and it's what both you and, and Professor uh, Rabab talked about is when we tell our narrative, context is vital. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go too much into that because we will have uh, some comments and questions afterwards. But I think we will go to Ismail now and, and what she talked about, hey, that. Artic artistic influence um, through unending dialectic processes. And I think this is perfect to go into uh, what Ismail will, will discuss with us now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saham, and, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, thank you to the Jerusalem Fund uh, and the Palestine Center for putting this conversation together. I think it's incredibly important as we mark um, we mark uh, the anniversary of, of Hassan's assassination. Um, and I'm really honored to be here with, with you, Haider, and with you, Rabab, um, both of whom I have tremendous respect for, for your work. And, um, and so it's a, it's a real honor for me. Uh, I'd also like to do my land acknowledgement. I am normally based in Chile, which is uh, unceded uh, Mapuche land. I'm currently in Chicago which is um, unceded uh, land of the, the Council of Three Fires. So I think it's uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Patawatomi land, uh, among others. Um, so thank you, Rabab, for, for starting with the land acknowledgement. I think it is incredibly important. Um, and, you know, I also want to acknowledge I'm not an expert on, on Kenafani. I'm not a, a, a scholar. Um, in the same right as, as uh, Dr. Abdul Hadi or you, Haidar. Um, so I'm not gonna, uh, I think I'm more interested in, in, in kind of sharing a, some thoughts of my experience as a diasporic Palestinian American writer uh, and my relationship to kind of Fanny, the way that he's influenced my work, the way my work has uh, also adapting directly his work. And to acknowledge that also I am someone who writes in English. I am a Palestinian from the diaspora who writes in, in, in the colonizer's language, as it were. And also much of my relation to Kanafani's work has been, you know, I've read much of, more of his work in translation. Um, so I want to just acknowledge that. Um, but, and, and really a lot of what I wanted to say was already said by you, Rabab, and, and by you, Haidar, much more eloquently, I think, than I could put it. So I'm actually eager to get to our kind of open discussion and, and question and answers. But I think some of the things I'll, I wanted to echo about Hassan, I mean, first of all, as it was mentioned, when he was assassinated, he was only 36. Um, you know, I'm 30, I'm almost 40 right now. And, and I think it is important to acknowledge that both in terms of how dangerous he was to the Zionist colonial project and to imperialism and for them to assassinate him as they did so many other artists and intellectuals and, and militants, which you mentioned Rabab, not only in the Palestinian context, but internationally, um, whether we're talking about the Panthers or in other anti-colonial movements. So I think it's In, very important to put it in that.
It's not him. It, yeah, it froze for a minute. If, if there's okay. a problem with that. Oh, Oh, okay. Just let me know if you. If... Yeah. Am I am I still frozen? No. Okay. Just give me a go like this if I freeze again. <laughs> um, but to also put into context the influence I think that Hassan would have had in kind of entering the pantheon of great anti-colonial third world, so to speak, global South writers, had he not been assassinated at su such a young age, because I mean, his output as an intellectual, as a, as a visual artist, as a novelist, a short story writer, even children's stories, uh, plays, was quite prolific for his age. And I think that it's very safe to assume that had he continued exploring that um, his craft, he would have really blossomed into something even more special. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that and also to mourn that loss, uh, which is, you know, why we're gathering here today. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that for me has been so important, and I think for many others about kind of Fanny's work is the degree to which he really, and, and both Rabab and Haidar have spoken to this a bit, but he really, I mean, besides his international perspective, besides, besides his class analysis, which is, and his anti-imperialist, anti-colonial clarity, um, is the degree to which in the Palestinian context, I think he really complicated the narratives of victimhood, of um, of, of our relationship to nostalgia as well, and and the degree to which those things often act as um, as a hindrance to action, right? And the degree to which our connection to the past is obviously important, and he excavated, but only if it serves as a bridge not only to the present, but to an imagined future. And that requires action. And I think so much of his work, as Haider talked about and Rabab talks about, kind of mines and excavates what it means to take action, right? What it means to, to, to shy away from action, what it means to be caught in the past, what it means to shut off our future or not. And I think whether it's Men in the Sun, whether it's Returning to Haifa, All That's Left to You, all of those stories and his short stories really deal with that in, 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 very, in very complex, nuanced, but clear ways. Um, and I think for me, uh, you know, some of the, the, the passages in Returning to Haifa, which I adapted for the stage with Naomi Wallace, the great American playwright. Um, and it should be mentioned also when we talk about censorship, whether it's um, censorship, you know, in the most extreme form, which would, you know, be the form of assassination in Hassan's case, or the other forms of censorship. Um, you know, our play, our adaptation was commissioned by the public theater in New York and was then, because of pressure from the board, canceled. Uh, precisely because of what Rabab talked about, about th th this, uh, you know, what is the narrative around Hassan as an artist, as an intellectual, and, and that line that is often blurred between resistance and terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think it is important that to, to, to acknowledge the kind of multiple censorships and assassinations of Kanafani and other figures, um, you know, up till this day. And, and I think that's also contributed besides his early passing to the degree to which his work has not, um, entered the mainstream, so to speak, in the way that it deserves to. And I think that has to do with the degree to which he has, it continues to be censored because of his identity as a Palestinian. So all of this 
we've mentioned, but I think it's important to reiterate. And, um, you know, I wanted to, to really quickly read a couple passages in uh, of translate, you know, that have been translated. So this is, I believe, the Barbara Harlow translation of uh, returning to Haifa. But that for me embody some of the kind of brilliant uh, ways in which he complicates the narrative of memory, of victimhood, um, and, and in the Palestinian context, and also internationalizes it. And, and I think one thing that in my experience with returning to Haifa that's so powerful about the book is also the character of Miriam, the, the Holocaust survivor, right? And I think it's incredibly ironic that returning to Haifa in the case of my adaptation was censored for its kind of, you know, uh, offensive Palestinian narrative when actually it was really ahead of its time. And maybe Haidar, you can speak a little bit to this as well, I'm because I'm not a scholar of it. But I mean, his, the large, um, amount of time in the novella, which Meriam, this Holocaust survivor, who is a participant in the Zionist colonial project, somewhat unwitting, but the amount of time she has to talk about her experience as, as, an, as a survivor of Auschwitz, or, or her family survived Auschwitz, and her, her experience as a, as a refugee uh, fleeing uh, the Holocaust, I mean, are I mean it's incredibly compassionate, empathetic, um, and, and again, complicates this narrative of the Palestinian as being kind of inherently anti-Semitic, et cetera. And, and so I, <clears throat> I do think it's quite ironic that that is one of the stories of his that is censored, considering it was so ahead of its time, it's so compassionate. Um, and I just like to read a couple passages that I think are, are, are remarkable. Um, and again, this is a translation. Um, so at this point, for those of you who are not familiar with the story of returning to Haifa, uh, Said and Safiya are two Palestinians who are forced to flee their home in 1948 in Haifa. And in the midst of the chaos of their forced displacement, um, leave their infant child in the house and are forced to flee and, and never recover him. And the story jumps back and forth between 1948 and 1967 when the couple is first able to go back to their house in Haifa. And they encounter Miriam, whom I mentioned, who has now taken over their house. And of course, they find out that not only did she take over their house, but she adopted uh, their son. Uh, and they meet him and he is when they meet him you know he sets up this beautifully dramatic uh encounter between Said and Safiya and their lost son who is now a young Israeli soldier um and what ensues is this amazing conversation between the son and the father mostly uh unfortunately Safiya is not terribly um outspoken in that dialogue and that we can talk about um, that from maybe from a feminist perspective, but that's also not my, my field of expertise, but I, I would be interested to see if anybody has anything to say about that. But he uh, says to Dov, uh, his son Khaldun is now named, has been named Dov. And he says, my wife asked, and this is just a short passage, uh, my wife asks if the fact that we're cowards gives you the right to be this way. As you can see, she innocently recognizes that yes, we were cowards. From that standpoint, you are correct, but that doesn't justify anything for you. Two wrongs do not make a right. If that were the case, then what happened to Ifrat and Miriam in Auschwitz was right. When are you going to stop considering the weaknesses, the weakness and the mistakes of others are endorsed over the account of your own prerogatives. These old catchwords are worn out. These mathematical equations are full of cheating. First, you say that our mistakes justify your mistakes. Then you say one wrong doesn't absolve another. You use the first logic to justify your presence here and the second to avoid the punishment your presence here deserves. 
It seems to me you greatly enjoy this strange game. Here again, you are trying to fashion a racehorse out of our weakness and mount its back. He goes on to say, and he ends by saying, uh, I know that one day you'll realize these things and you'll realize that the greatest crime any human being can commit, whoever he may be, is to believe even for one moment that the weakness and mistakes of others give him the right to exist at their expense and justify his own mistakes and crimes. And uh, I mean, I think for me, what was so overwhelming when I read that is that, and this speaks, I think, to the, the continued timeliness and relevance of Kanafani's thinking and his positionality is that that could be so easily used today to respond to Zionist logic, as it were, colonial logic. I mean, the, nothing has, has changed. And I think Kenafani so clearly kind of identified, pinpointed, and, and um, honed in on the incoherence and the violence of colonial logic in the in the case of Zionism, and again the the interview Rabab you mentioned at the beginning, which everybody should watch if they have not, uh, which is one of the few I think filmed interviews of Kanafani in English with the Australian reporter, and it's full of those moments in which his clarity is cutting and astonishingly efficient in, in, in negating, undermining, undermining and transcending that kind of colonial logic and rejecting it. Uh, and one of the best moments, which Rabab, it's right before I think the moment you mentioned is which he, the Australian reporter says, well, what about dialogue? What about uh, a dialogue? You mean the dialogue between in, the neck and the sword. And I mean, there's something so, so clear about the way that he kind of cuts through the logic in his writing and his political activism that I think makes him so timely and, and relevant uh, to, to today. I think the other moment I wanted to talk about that I think is so brilliant about returning to Haifa, and again, Haidar and Rabab, if, if, if I'm sure there's, I know there's translation issues uh, in the English, it's not perfect, and I'm sure the Arabic is even more, um, more profound and more nuanced, but, uh, so forgive me for using the English, but um, he, he has one of the most important moments in the play, which is about, which is essentially a call to Palestinian resistance to action to kind of um and a, and a and a criticism of palestinian weakness i think he does something so brilliant in returning to haifa which he has one of the most important lines about that not come from saeed the palestinian or safiya the other palestinian whom we meet but dove who of course in reality is palestinian but he's been raised as an israeli he's an israeli soldier and I think there's something so brilliant about how he has those lines come from an Israeli. And I think that there's so many lessons we can learn about that today as we, as we tackle this, all of these same issues in, in opposing Zionist colonial logic and propaganda. Um, and he says, Dov says, you should not have left Haifa. If that wasn't possible, then no matter what it took, you should not have left an infant in its crib. And if that was also impossible, then you should never have stopped trying to return. You say that too was impossible. 20 years have passed, sir, 20 years. What did you do during that time to reclaim your son? If I were you, I would have borne arms for that. I would have borne arms for that. Is there any stronger motive? You are weak, weak. You are bound by heavy chains of backwardness and paralysis. Don't tell me you spent 20 years crying. Tears won't bring back the missing or the lost. Tears won't work miracles. All the tears in the world won't carry a small boat holding two parents searching for their lost child. Um, so you spent 20 years crying? That's what you tell me now? Is this your dull, worn out weapon? And of course, 
Haidar, you can probably speak to the context in which this was written, right? So this was written right at the kind of the onset of the Palestinian National Liberation Movement of the 19 armed resistance movement of the 19 late 1960s. So I mean, it is a call to arms very much within its, you know, the historical context, it's important to, to recognize that, but I think it's a brilliant call to arms, but it's also a brilliant use of the Israeli as the Israeli character as the messenger uh, in this case. Um, and so, you know, I really, I would love to open it up. I just want to say a couple things about how Kenafani has influenced my work. Um, and I think Rabab referred to kind of the intersectional, intersectional, I know that use, that word is overused, but the intersectional nature of, of Kenafani's politics and his work. Um, and so for me, that's always been a, a great appeal of Kenafani. And I recognize that like many others very early on upon reading his work. Um, and also, I mean, you mentioned about his work on the 1936 revolt. I, mean, I had one of my first plays was uh, was Tennis and Nablus, which is about the, the revolt against the British, that the Palestinian revolt against the British from 1936 to 39, which I used, one of the many sources I used was kind of Fanny's work. Um, I have a play, Sabra, uh, in addition to adapting, returning to Haifa, I have a play, Sabra Falling, which is about, which takes place in the months leading up to the massacres in Sabra and Shatila. By the way, we're about to hit in this September the, what, 40th anniversary. Um, and one of the, I won't go into the details of the play, but it's very heavily influenced by Kenafani, and there's a character who who is a kind of stand-in for Kenafani of the martyred, uh, assassinated, lost um, Palestinian writer who kind of comes back. But all of this is, is to say is that even as a writer in diaspora using English, uh, Kenafani, and this goes to what you said, I think, Haidar, about how much there is left to excavate and to discover about Kanafani's work. And, and at least as a creative writer, uh, I find that I'm constantly nourished and fed and surprised and guided by Kanafani's work um, and also his his way of thinking, which goes to what you were saying, uh, Rabab, about him being an organic intellectual and just an incredibly innovative writer. I mean, I think the last thing I'll say, Haider, when you're speaking about all that's left to you, is also the form that he uses in that novella and that story is 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 really really innovative. Um, I mean, there's 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 actually some kind of use. I guess I would describe it as magical realism. And so, I mean, he has this, you know, very intense realism in his work, of course, and historical social analysis. But um, I mean, in that story, for those of you who haven't read it, I mean, the, 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 the desert is a character, the moon is a character who, who speak. Um, and, and so I think it is also important to, to, and this goes to my first point about what Kenafani uh, the cutting short of his life deprived us of is also seeing his his literary output evolve and expand and experiment with new forms, um, which other writers, you know, have gotten the chance to do over the course of their lives and he didn't, but he left us so much and he left so many signs of being on this path of, of great innovation and experimentation and, um, and intellectual uh, political clarity. So I, I think I'll stop it there because I, I know we're gonna, we need time for questions and, uh, and I'd really love to kind of go back yeah. and forth with Rob and, and Haidar. So thank you guys yeah. for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Smahin. Um, I think that was, wow. It was beautiful. I mean, in terms of, I love the example that you gave about how Kenafani uses Dove um, to, to narrate um, it, I mean, the, the, the complexity, you know, the, you know, 
you know, why did you leave? Why didn't you stay and fight? And exactly like um, Haydar and Rabab, you know, pointed out of, you know, uh, exile, death and history, the trajectory of, of that and, and, and where, where we are now um, in, uh, in our struggle. Um, but I, I do have a few questions actually. And before that, we do have a comment, which I think is very important from, from a, a viewer who says, who said that we should acknowledge uh, Lamis, Lamis Najan, uh, Hassan Kanatani's niece, who was also killed, uh, assassinated. And we did, we did at the beginning, but we're also just going to take, you know, just her, another reminder that Lamisa, who I believe was 17 only, she was only 17 years old and someone can correct me. Um, she was also murdered um, when Hassan Kanatani was murdered. So yes, we, we do acknowledge that as well. Um, with, with Ismail, I just want to start with you, if that's okay. Um, why did you choose returning to Haifa to adapt into a play given all of Kanatani's works, all his writings? Um, you know, books, uh, small, you know, the short stories. Uh, why? I mean, what resonated with you the most? I mean, I mean, I think you spoke about it, but if you can just delve into it a little deeper, um, yeah. why did you choose that play? And again, how does this connect to your other works? Because you have other works, including letters from young activists, Truth Serum Blues, that are my people and others. Can you can you just go a little bit more into that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I touched on it a, a bit, but I, I think speaking as a as a dramatist, as a as a playwright, um, I mean, first of all, I think that there is much work to be done in in experimenting with adapting uh, kind of Fanny's other work for the stage. And also for the screen. I mean, some of it's been done in the Arab world. There is a there is a, a film of returning to Haifa, I believe, from the from the late sixties, maybe early seventies, um, and and others. But and I think there's much much to be done, and and I would love to continue doing it, and I'm sure others would as well, and are. Um, I think returning to Haifa is. Um, for me, it was, and I owe a lot of credit to Naomi Wallace, who, who brought the idea to me, uh, um, at, to us, uh, you know, proposed it. I think there's something inherently, I mean, there's something inherently dramatic about the setup. I mean, it is very theatrical. I mean, the setup of these people returning to their home and finding someone living in it and then finding their son. I mean, it, 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 it's almost um, soap operatic in a way, but 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 there's he takes this this kind of somewhat inconceivable in, uh, encounter and really runs with it and kind of even at some point acknowledges the the kind of ludicrousness of it and the kind of um, uh, kind of sentiment and he's constantly kind of referencing the sentimentality and 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 referencing the kind of how ridiculous the interaction is and how unbelievable and surreal it is and so he kind of leans into it but I think as a as a dramatist as a playwright you're looking for those I mean in a sense it's it's a it's a family drama it is is kind of this archetypical uh, ar archetypal kind of you know the the lost son, the prodigal son. Uh, it it is there's so much conflict baked into this very simple encounter that takes place in a house between three then four people, and of course there's much else that happens in terms of remembering forty eight. Uh, you know, going to being in sixty seven, going back to forty eight, that you have to find a way to to put at least on stage, which I think we did a, a good job of. Um, but in itself, at its core, it is this dramatic interaction. It's a family drama. And, and it's this dramatic interaction between people who have different ways of seeing the past, present, and future, and how they reconcile them. And so I think in that sense, it was very well suited for the stage. Um, 
And I think what I mentioned before, the degree to which he has these very complex, um, very astutely drawn and utilized Israeli Jewish characters. Um, and that for me is as 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 a as an American, as someone who understands how to or is trying constantly trying to understand how to navigate the propaganda machine and insert and kind of subvert uh, our own narrative into oh, no, and, you know and, and and have it shared. That gave us a lot of possibility to do that. So um, I'll I'll stop there. I can talk maybe about okay. my other. I don't know at why. Another okay, it just cut off for some. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, I'll 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 pass it off to Rabab and Haida. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, before Rabab, I just want to mention because your other your other works include Guantanamo Bay and Jim Crow. I mean, with something you talked about intersectionality, I think that's that's very important. With Rabab, I know you had your hand up, but Rabab, just building on what Smail just talked about, could you talk about the relationship between Kanafani and Najal Ali, um, how is their work also interconnected? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, say, actually, we are really indebted to Barbara Harlow for translating. The late Barbara Harlow, I think it's really, really important to also uh, kind of recognize her role. I know there is uh, all sorts of critiques and so on, which is fine, and we can do another discussion in that. But I think Barbara Harlow had done a great job to translate. Yeah lot of sank and fan and make it possible in the engagement that she has done as a public intellectual because she was also uh, bringing in the uh, the right of Irish prisoners she was working on South Africa so and she was actually a very close friend to us in the Union of Palestinian Women's Associations in North America actually she led she she co-organized with us and she led the first delegation in 1990 that we've sent to Palestine uh, during the 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 father of the stone. So, I mean, there is kind of like things that don't get mentioned a lot. And I actually was looking in her CV to, to look at it. And just, she says, she's just went there. I'm kind of, hmm, you played much, much more role. But I wanted to also say a thing about, I think with Aid al Haifa, and I also, of course, I leave the last word to, to Haider and to Smail, because Haider, you're the comparative literature person, and Smail, you're the playwright. But I think Aid al Haifa was sort of like a necessary political. Uh, I mean, you're talking now about after 67, you're talking about the whole question of the, of the, of the quote unquote, the Jewish question within the Palestinian movement. So there is a whole discussion. How do you deal with quote unquote, the Jewish question? What do you do? There is this discussion about do, you, do we say as Palestinians, all the Jews that came after 1948 must leave? Should Jews who have come after and got settled stay? What happens with it? I mean, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also assuming all of these questions about if we had the right and the ability to be able to say what we want. So there is one thing about what do we want? There is another thing, are we able to implement what we want? And then there is all this dialogue that's come from, from Dog. that's actually all of this, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you? As if there are actually choices. It's a very liberal engagement as if people actually have choices. You know, you're, you're, you, you get kicked out and you, you leave the food on the stove and some people left the food because they thought they're going to come back. And some people locked the key because they thought within two weeks and people were told come in two weeks. So when you talk to people in, who lived 1948, a lot of people will say, we thought we were coming back. Why didn't you take more clothes? Why didn't you talk more things and so on? Because most people did not think that this is going to be the last time they will see their homeland, the last time they'll see their oceans, the last time. So there is this whole question, the necessity to respond to course, course, the Jewish question and the relationship. And of course, there is a lot of Zionist dialogue, a lot of Zionist discussion at that time, propaganda, Hasbara, we call it today, claiming that Palestinians want to throw the Jews into the sea, attributing even that to Ahmed Shukairi, the poor guy has never even said that and spent all his life trying to prove that he hasn't even said that until an Israeli writer writes an article in the Journal of Palestine Studies and says, actually, it wasn't really uh, Ahmed Shukairi. But nonetheless, so all of this propaganda there, and you need to intervene. So I think Hassan Kenafani is also intervening in that 
intervening in that in the sense of responding to the Zionist uh, propaganda, also responding to the debate within the Palestinian movement. Who is a Palestinian? And you know, there's a big debate. Is a Palestinian one whose a father is a Palestinian? His father or a mother, like the generation of Palestinian women say, which the Declaration of Independence later on said, yes, father or mother. Although a lot of the stuff in the Declaration of Independence is thrown out the window with the Palestinian Authority. And let's not, we can get into that, but I don't think we should like maybe spoil too much. I mean, I, Haider, you, you said a lot of beautiful things about that. We can. But so I, I, I think that, that, that one, one aspect of it that always, always comes up to the whole liberal question. Why did you do this? And it's also in the interview with, with Rassan, as if there is any choices of the oppressed when the tools, the battles, the timing, the, the, the zone, whether you're fasting in Ramadan or not, whether it's hot or not, whether whatever, whatever, going, you, not nothing, you don't get to choose anything except you choose to how you respond. That's the only thing you, are, you get to choose. And even choosing to respond has also implications. So I think this is something that, that I that, that I just wanted to say that and and kind of like move on to 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 okay so with with Najil Ali which I think it actually takes to Najil Ali because Najil Ali was the ultimate defiant stubborn Palestinian who did not give a damn I mean this is kind of like this is where I stand this is what I'm doing and Najil met Ghassan Kanafani in Ain al Hilwa in 1962 in Khayyam Ain al Hilwa refugee camp. In 1962, Ghassan Kanafani has been the editor of Al Hurriya, which was before preceded Adal Hadaf, which the National Arab National Movement bought along with the Munadamat Al Amal Shiwai, the Lebanese, the, the organization of communist uh, uh, work action in Lebanon, Mohsen Ibrahim. They bought it together and they started it in 1959, actually. Ghassan Kanafani goes to Ayn al-Hilwa and through all, all of the times public intellectuals engage with the masses and the masses of the Palestinians are actually in refugee camps in Lebanon and bumps into this uh, young artist who shows him one of his draws, draw, drawings and Ghassan Kanafani decides to publish them in Al-Hurriya. And they're very interesting, the dialogue, and I actually was looking it up more and more uh, because one of the writers, Shakir al nabilsi actually recounts what has happened between Ghassan Kanafani and Najil Ali. And the, the, the drawing uh, Naji gives him is a drawing of a tent and, and a pyramid. And there is this whole debate about why a tent and a pyramid. So one discussion about Naji, because we also have Arab depth. We're not just Palestinians, which is, I love it, because there is this whole thing about Palestinians being, we're this narrow nationalist, nobody is with us, we're alone. You know, we are nobody standing with us. I'm kind of like, People just wake up and, and smell the roses. There is so much solidarity. There has never been more solidarity with any cause in the world, more with the Palestinians. Let's not, you know, kind of like be the exceptional victims. I mean, we are actually part and parcel of this. Then he says the reason of it is because the pyramids were where the Egyptians die. The temp is where Palestinians live. But neither of them can actually be put inside the house. They always have to be in open air. And he says that the, 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 the camp is where the Palestinian lives. And then through the dialogue continues on and on and on about it. I mean, every single time, and I, and I invite you to kind of look at the description of it. It's very, very interesting. It's a very long debate, discussion, and people are watching. So Ghassan Kanafani and Najil Ali, obviously Ghassan Kanafani is this very big shot already, intellectual, well-known, editor of Korea, and Najil Ali, is Mkhayyamji, right? Refugee camp, young man who's drawing, writing, and so on. And start of coming, and I can actually like even feel it because, and, and I'm not saying from the camps themselves, but I know some of my students will come to me, and I had a Palestinian student come to me and said to me, Are you going to be teaching about Akbar? Are you going to be teaching about Balfour Declaration? Are you going to start Palestine in 1967? And I said, Listen, you are going to to learn about everything. I mean, just if you have the time, 16 weeks, we're going to do it. But this kind of like defiance, questioning constantly, constantly. And the defiance is also questioning being imprisoned mentally, being captive mentally, being told you can think or you cannot think. And Najil Ali is saying, no, we can think about everything, which has ended up in his assassination. And he said, anybody who's gonna write, anybody who's going to draw, is going to die. And Najil Ali has a, has a, has a cartoon. So 
uh, interesting that he says, he says, what are you doing? Uh, uh, to, he's talking about uh, freedom and so on, the older man. And he says, what are you going to do to, uh, right tomorrow? He said, tomorrow I'm going to write my will, knowing that he's going to be assassinated because of his thought, because of freedom, freedom of thought and so on. So there's no this discussion between Naji and, 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 uh, and uh, the son Kenafani about it. Now, I want, uh, that was not Hamdallah, because Najil Ali did not create Hamdallah until after 1967. Najil Ali says Hamdallah was born on June 5th, 1967, when Naksa happened. Okay? Najil Ali is 10 years old, and Hamdallah 10 years old, has all his back to the world, and will only turn it around stubbornly, stubbornly, and this is, I think, it's very, very important. He's a refugee kid without shoes. And I always think about that when we think about comparative histories of resistance movement, I always think about the, the athletes in the 1968 Olympics, the black athletes who stood when they received the gold and the bronze uh, and the silver medal. And they had an Australian who was standing with them and did not actually raise his hand because he was in solidarity. They stood and they stood without shoes. They raised their fists and they stood without shoes or socks to connote what slavery is all about, what freedom is all about. And when the US national anthem was being played, which is the national anthem, just like Hatikva, the Israeli national anthem represents the US settler colonial state. They raised their fists, lowered their heads, and had no shoes. And for me, it actually brings how this, you spoke, Haider, about teaching to South African students. I'm talking about how do I teach and engage, co-learn actually with my students who come from American Indian, from black community, indigenous, Latinx, Asian Americans, and so on. And when do you see, and the San Jose State University is not very far from San Francisco State University, where the athletes were, and they were actually uh, expelled. I mean, just like Muhammad Ali was born. So to me, this is kind of like brings up the universality, not in a universal liberal, universal human rights and the French, uh, you know, uh, French Revolution slogans and so on, just so I'm not understood because I'm not misunderstood. That's not what I'm advocating. But that's where they, that, that, that kind of like brings in what Handala stood and, and Handala would ref, refuses to turn his face to the people. Yeah. I'm going to watch because I'm the conscious of humanity. I'm going to keep watching until Palestine will be free. So this is, in a sense, I just want to mention one more thing that the connection with us is that also we have a mural at San Francisco State University that Palestinian students and the community and students of color and indigenous students came together and put together. And actually, I believe my hiring was part of the sort of like a consolation prize, kind of hiring kind of reducing that tension that was between because the university refused because the Zionists refused to have Hamdala to be drawn on the mural. And Hamdala is not on the mural. And in that in that drawing, Hamdala has a, a pen in the hand, Al-Kalim al my word is my sword, the sun can pen. And the other hand is carrying key and on it written al awda return, which I guess connects with what you talk about. Uh, Ismail, return to Haifa, the people return and so on. And it took a very long struggle. So now the thing is, is that now Hamdala, because it was denied material existence on the painting of the uh, Edward Said, uh, the mural dedicated to Professor Edward Said at San Francisco State. Now Hamdala actually lives because on the day of the of the of the of the inauguration of the mural. All Palestinian students and their colleagues came wearing t-shirts having Hamdala on them. And now Hamdala actually lives as a symbol, just like Ghassan Kenafani. They assassinated Ghassan Kenafani and thought they will, they will silence Palestine and Palestinian narrative and Palestinian freedom. And it got so much bigger now. And the yeah. same Hamdala now lives among us, becomes part and parcel of the slogans. And what happened with the artists is that they replaced Hamdala because we couldn't do it with the sabbar, with the cactus, which symbolizes where Palestinian villages, they were destroyed in 1940. So, Rabab, Rabab, thank you. I just want to, connecting to that, um, Professor Eid, um, you, Kenneth Annie coined his writings 
uh, and those of his comrades as resistance literature. Um, could, you, could you discuss the importance of this and how other forms of expression like Rabab, uh, Professor Abdul Hadi just talked about uh, through Najla Ali and we know Carlos Latouf, we know P Banksy, I always Banksy. say his name right, wrong, Bank and other forms of uh, uh, other artists. We can say in a, it's, you know, there's a culture of resistance, but can you, can you discuss um, a cultural resistance through different forms of art? But can you discuss uh, what can if any meant by resistance literature? And also, can you just, if you can, as, as you're discussing that, talk about how can if any's writings changed over time? Yeah. Well, you know, I think our first refugee student, as um, as you know, uh, about eight. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I think my internet connection is unstable. Uh, you can hear me. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I will return. You know, I will ret returning to Haifa. I'll be returning to returning to Haifa um, later on. But I think you know, um, just addressing your question directly, I think the necessity of. Um, reading Palestinian literature, um, especially at this point in time, emanates from the importance of writing the Palestinian narrative. And I think this is one of the reasons why Israel decided to associate Ghassan Kanafani. Um, um, and, and I agree with Rabab about uh, Barbara Harlow. And by the way, Barbara Harlow was one of the uh, co-advisors, my co-advisors, you know, when I was writing my PhD thesis. Yeah, so yeah, I know her personally. And yes, I agree with every single word that you've just said, uh, um, Rabab. Um, but as um, Rabab, uh, sorry, Barbara said, in most Palestinian, most Palestinian literature is what Barbara, uh, borrowing from Ghassan Kanafani himself, called resistance literature. I think this is important. Now, um, we also need to understand, you know, um, that our familiarity and knowledge of this kind of literature. Uh, has unfortunately been dominated by what the market offers us, uh, what you know the West is offering us, what uh, imperialism is offering us. So our familiarity with the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, uh, Samih Al Qasim, Tawfiq Zayyad, Fatwa Tuqan, and the novels of Emil Habibi, um, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra. And Ghassan Kanafani himself, uh, to mention but a few, by the way, Palestinian, Palestinian writers, is extremely poor in the West. So I agree with what Ismail is saying. I agree with, uh, with uh, what Rabab is saying. It's extremely poor, um, to say the least. And if these great writers, you know, I remember an incident was I, when I was in South Africa and I had, um, um, I was attending a conference in Cape Town and this white, professor comes and he wants to have a debate with me. And he says, look, we have Nelson Mandela. Whom do you have? I said, we have Edward Said. And then he says to me, well, we have J.M. Kutsia. We have Nadine Gordamar, you know, Nobel laureate. I said, we have Ghassan Kanafani, but unfortunately you don't know Ghassan Kanafani. Unfortunately, you don't know Mahmoud Darwish for, for reasons you, you are familiar with. And I think if these great writers, you know, Ghassan Kanafani, Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, um, you know, Tawfiq Zayyad, uh, if they are, if they get read, their literature gets read, it's only in departments and, and Rabab knows, in departments of Islamic and Middle Eastern studies, not as, you know, great literature. It is not part of the canon you know, by literature, uh, not, you know, the kind of literature written by white middle-class men. And I think Edward Said, I mean, is an exception, is undoubtedly lucky enough to write in English and be published in the United States. So, but I'm also, you know, thinking of, you know, of ways to counter the Israeli Hasbara 
Hence the importance of rereading Ghassan Kalafani, rereading Mahmoud Darwish. I mean, take for example, um, what the ex-deputy director general of cultural affairs of the Israeli uh, foreign ministry, uh, what was his name? Mekel, Arya Merkel, M M not Merkel, Mekel. Uh, what he had to say, he said, he said, we will send, and I'm paraphrasing, um, we will send well-known novelists from Israel, well-known writers from Israel overseas. Um, we will send theater companies exhibits abroad. And in this way, you show Israel's, he, he said it, and I'm quoting, prettier face by sending those writers. Amos Oz comes to my mind, by the way. Um, so we in Israel are not thought of purely in the context of war, colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why Hassan Kanafani is important. And this is why resistance literature, resistance literature is important to show our face, to show the Palestinian face, to continue writing and rewriting, reading and rereading the Palestinian narrative. Uh, but I want to go back, if, if you allow me, um, I know we are running out of time, and this is why I want to seize this moment. And since Ismail and Rabab mentioned that, you know, of teaching, um, you know, um, uh, returning to Haifa to my uh, Palestinian students here, I, I, teach, I teach two courses on, you know, prose, the novel, the novel as, as, as a genre. And, um, and I think, you know, you know, the novel as a genre and my view of narrative in general and fiction and the, narr and, and, and the novel as a genre is not just as something that, you know, we teach and study in a classroom. Um, in Palestine, no, on the contrary, it has everything to do with real life with real life, including our resistance to settler colonialism, apartheid and Palestine, and now our resistance to this genocidal siege that has been imposed on Gaza for 15 years. And, and this is a reflection of my belief in the, in the rationale behind our profession as teachers, and I'm sure Rabab agrees with this, as teachers of literature worldwide in general, and in Palestine in particular. And, and this is why I think it is, it is time to include Palestinian literature coming back to Rabab's point into the body of research that has become, that has became known as, you know, critical race theory. Yeah, it is very important since most of Palestinian literature has been ideologically committed to the struggle against institutionalized racism, resistance literature. And of course, in light of now recently, in light of the reports by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, the, es the Esqua before them. Um, and and, and, and this, is, this is the context we need to be, within which we need to be discussing, you know, the importance of teaching Ghassan Kanafani. And this is why I decided to include Ghassan Kanafani's novels in my course, especially the heart and mind wrenching, wrenching you know, returning to Haifa. Um, and I can tell you by experience, and I think this is important for you, Ismail, because you kept asking me this question. You know, as a teen Asian, I ended up believing that I read, I read Returning to Haifa as a teenager, by the way. And Ghassan Kanafani literature in the first Antifada was banned here in Palestine. You know this very well, of course. So, you know, I, I, I read it in the evening, you know, in my bed. And uh, I ended up believing that Kanafani was a challenging thinker. I remember, you know, using these words, challenging think, thinker who understood that the most profound truths, truths tend to bewilder. Um, of course, breaking, later on I understood, the breaking with inherited uh, paradigms and so-called, you know, common sense about Palestine, Israel, and I agree with every single word you said, uh, Ismail, about that conversation, especially that conversation between uh, Khaldun Dov, Khaldun who became Dov, the Israeli soldier, and, and, and Saeed, you know, the father. Um, you know, everybody knows, I mean, you said it, it's a typical Palestinian story. 
Coincidentally, today I went to my barber and he was telling me, you know, a similar story about somebody in 1948 who left their child in, in Yibna. My own aunt, my own aunt, I come from the village of Zarnuga, which was ethnically closed in 1948. Uh, the distance between Zarnuga, the village of Zarnuga and Yibna, the village of Yibna is about, you know, eight to eight to 10 kilometers. My aunt who died last year, she told me the story of, you know, of Walid, Walid has, her, was her um, eldest son. She left Walid at home and she forgot Walid because they said they are attacking us until they reached Yibna. And then suddenly, where is, where is Walid? And her, her husband had to go back to Zarnuga in order to fetch Walid. And I think the conversation taking place between the returning Palestinian father uh, and his, uh, his son, who was of course no longer his son, he was his biological son, not, it's, it's not only a serious, and I'm addressing your question, Ismail, is not only a serious challenge to what is taken for granted, but is also a form of radical thinking. You know, who could raise see these questions at the time? You know, a form of radical thinking envisaging an alternative, an alternative future. The ultimate question, and I'm going to end with this, the ultimate question we are left with is about the best ways of fighting the Zionist matrix of power, namely settler colonialism, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing. That is the conclusion I, I you know, I reach with with my students after teaching them um, returning to Haifa. You know, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Aid. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time left, but just you know, there was, uh, you know, we mentioned always a lot of phenomenal um, male writers and artists. We also have a great list of. Uh, Palestinian uh, women revolutionaries, um, including Salma Jayusi, Susan Abu Hawa, Sahar Khalifa, Ghada Karmi, Jean Makdisi, uh, Samira Azam, Soha Sabah, Anne Marie Jasser, and you mentioned Fedwa Tukan, May Zaida, and, and others. And I think it's very important for us to normalize, you know, um, the, uh, you know, the female and feminist thinkers and contributors to our struggle. Um, and like I said, it's very important for us to, to kind of normalize that in our everyday language because um, they have also uh, contributed through their narratives, whether it's poetry, books, plays, uh, and so forth. So, um, I do, we do have a few more questions, but we do have a suggestion that maybe in the next couple of days or so, maybe we can continue for another hour because we do have a lot of people watching and there are a lot of questions coming, but we will end maybe with this one for now and then we will talk to you individually, all of you, to see if we can do maybe one more hour because it seems like there is a big request for, uh, to continue this. Um, what would Ghassan Kanathani have thought about the current situation in Palestine now? Uh, Haydar, Professor. Yeah, um, yeah, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. You know, I think, I think, um, I think we will need a couple of hours to address this question. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. But uh, you know, I will try to be very, very quick. I think you know it is clearly it's very important. You know, and as I said, Hassan Kanafani's ideas, Hassan Kanafani's you know literature is definitely um, inexhaustible. I think what is important to understand is that Hassan Kanafani was able to grasp, grasp and portray Palestinian life in a very profound human and, you know, historical fashion. Had he still been alive, I think the first thing Ghassan Kanafani would have done is to oppose the disastrous Oslo Accords in, signed in 1993 between the official leadership of the PLO and, and the Zionist entity. Definitely, I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that Ghassan Kanafani would have attacked fiercely 
you know, the Oslo Accords. But also, I think Hassan Kanafani would have had a very, very serious problem judging by um, returning to Haifa, uh, judging by, uh, you know, the open ending of all that is left to you. And Yasmail, the conversation, this fascinating conversation but be between the returning father and his Israeli-Palestinian son that Hassan Kanafani would have definitely refused to uh, recognize Israel and therefore he would have vehemently opposed what I call the racist two-state solution, i.e. Um, and judging by the ideas you know, presented by Saeed in uh, returning to Haifa, Ghassan Kanafani would have definitely supported the establishment of a secular democratic state in historic Palestine, a state for all of, of all of its citizens, regardless of race, ethnicity, ethnicity religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also, and this is the last point, um, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that Ghassan Kanafani would have definitely supported the BDS campaign boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And he would have been a great supporter, especially of, you know, ACBI, academic and cultural um, boycott of Israel. Would have, would Ghassan Kanafani have supported, you know, um, revolutions in the, in the Arab world? Definitely. That's what Men in the Sun is about. It's about the necessity, the importance and necessity of uh, social revolution in the Arab world. And again, um, um, definitely we need another hour or a couple of hours to address this question. Yeah. Siham, I, I, uh, I actually have to go because I have to take care of my daughter. Um, so I would love to continue on, but I would urge you guys to do so without me and it'll be uh, an amazing conversation uh, nonetheless. Um, but I want to just respond if I could to that question before, I mean, I'll leave in maybe, I can stay maybe 10 more minutes, but um, I mean, I, I agree with Haider about his, I mean, his response to what would have, what would Hassan's position be today. I would also add, I think that he would be at the forefront of that kind of resurgence of intersectionality of connecting Palestine to Black Lives Matter to other uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist movements, um, and, and I think that that's happening. And I and I and my other answer to that would be, I mean, we can speculate endlessly about what the Hassan would, what his position would have been. Um, but I think so much of that we can actually look to the younger generations in Palestine and in the diaspora, who I think have been influenced by Hassan and his moral clarity um, and his, his um, solidarity and his militancy and his creativity. And I would say, you know, let's also, when we talk about resistance literature and, and, and young artists and, and women especially, also acknowledge the place of hip hop in, in Palestinian, as, as a form of Palestinian resistance literature today. And as I think one of the most militant forms. Um, so I think we can listen to those voices on the ground in the diaspora to kind of answer that question, in a, you know, uh, that we've asked. Um, so I just want to kind of put that out there. And I also wanted to say, you know, uh, speaking of young writers, um, you know, one of the young writers that's uh, Palestinian writers who's kind of emerged in the last year or so has been Mohammed al Kurk. And, you know, I think I found that his response to when he was being uh, silenced and censored by the ADL had many echoes of Hassan's own response in those interviews that we mentioned so many times. Um, and just to give you a quick quote, just to give a shout out to the younger generation, um, when he was being censored by the ADL, uh, Mohammed al Kurd said, I'm not scared of the ADL or its predictable racist smear campaigns. It has no moral authority over me or any advocate for Pal of Palestinian liberation. I will not negotiate my vocabulary, let alone my character with defenders of Zionism, colonialism, and apartheid. One look at the organization's shameful history is enough to strip it of any legitimacy its deceptive name might offer. 
So, I mean, for me, that response in its moral clarity, in its efficiency, in its um, unapologetic nature is very much the inheritor. I mean, it is, you know, I see the DNA of uh, Hassan's moral and political positions in that response. Um, so I just wanted to shout out to, to those younger artists and activists on the ground um, who are in some ways, I think, carrying that legacy uh, today. Thank you, Rabab, you have the last word. Yeah, okay, I'm going, thank you. I'm going, it's, uh, it's a very, very rich conversation, very difficult to uh, cut down. I want to respond to every single word, like I want to have a conversation with Haider separately, Smile separately, with you separately, not separately, but continuing the conversation. But I will say a couple of things uh, to kind of like in, in, in the spirit of call and response. Um, Haider said, talked about how Hassan resonates in the Arab world. Actually, Al Hadaf has always been a place for Arab writers from all over. Some of them who disagreed with actually the official line of the PFLP and wrote and wrote and wrote. And I think this this has been including Iraqi communists, for example, and so on. So I think this is this is also the availability, the space for us to think and get out the imaginary from the confines of what we are supposed to think to what we can think and how can we connect the imaginary. Second thing is that I think what Ghassan Kenafani would do is my, maybe we'll go back to the Mukhayyamat. We'll go back to the people, not in Mukhayyamat to idealize in Mukhayyam, but because the majority of the Palestinians are either in refugee camps or children of refugees. I mean, this is the reality of the matter. And to think about what does this mean, whether you talk about Najil Ali, whether you talk about, I remember when, 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 uh, uh, in, 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 and I'm, I'll mention that in a minute, uh, uh, talking about also women and so on. Layla Khaled, when she was, when she said that, oh, there is a plane that has been hijacked to release her, she said, I, it went to my head. I thought I was actually, maybe I will become too big of a deal and so on. So I went back to the camps and I went back to teaching in order for me to become more modest and more humble and learn from the people. And then that message also is the question of collectivity, is the question. So I want to also say about the young people also, there is a lot of efforts. And I really want to give a shout out, for example, to the Palestinian youth movement that has so many events throughout that have been going on, offering the Ghassan Kenafani Award for many, many, many years, a competition. And I remember actually when it started, and I'm just very happy to be one of the elders, one of the OGs, who many of my students are the leaders who led and are, are leading the next generation of Palestine who are actually doing so many activities. And it's this kind of like bringing people together, thinking about how, and it actually breaks the kind of siege when Haider is talking about the captivating and the suffocating siege of Gaza. And nonetheless, we still see the creativity. We still see professors like Haider A teaching. We still see the, 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 the young people, the students, the bloggers who are blogging left and right every single day where they're from Gaza. I think that I also want to talk about the Palestinians in the 48 because one of the first literature articles Hassan Kenafani wrote was Adab al Muqam of the 48, the literature of the 1948. And I want to say about kind of like the way people are resisting one of the major things, not only Taliyat, which we all know about the Palestinian women's movement that is actually bringing all sorts of injustices together. I also want to talk about the soldiers movement that says refuse to serve in the Israeli military. Maybe it's an answer to them and my people will protect me. I mean, this is, we have examples throughout, but we also talking about captivity and the ways in which the voice is silenced, the body is silenced, the spirit is silenced, is that until now, Israel is also holding the bodies of many Palestinian prisoners and fighters who have been killed by Israel in uh, either uh, freezers or in so-called numbered cemeteries. So we're talking, when we're talking about captivity, we're talking about multiple and complex and multi-layers of captivities that the sense of kind of the literature and the art that Ghassan Kenafani, Najil Ali, Sabahne, Ismail Khalidi, uh, the young people from PYM, Chris Ghazali, the muralists, the singers, 
I mean, we're, we're talking about all of this incredible, 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 like it's a huge heritage, huge tradition that has been archives of thick, important messages that are coming out that Israel is trying to snuff and is unable to do so, just in exactly the same way that Muhammad al Qud responded to the anti defamation League. This is really, I mean, aside from everything else we're doing, we, our role as intellectuals, as public intellectuals, as engaged intellectuals, and so on, is to be able to continue to support the narrative, to demand, to refuse settler colonialism, and to insist on the indivisibility of justice. You're right, Ismail. I hate the word intersectionality. I, I think it, I don't think it's enough. I don't think it captures what it is, but this has to do with the language. But please let me that. I think we are in a process, and I'm, I'm kind of like, I just want to say that I would invite everybody to kind of maybe in the future, Nick, we can talk about our project Teaching Palestine because the 2022 edition marks the 50th anniversary of Kenafani's assassination, the 40th anniversary of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in the Sabra and Shatila massacre, 15th anniversary of the siege of Gaza, and the 20th anniversary of not only building the upper side wall, but the reinvasion of Palestinian uh, so-called areas and the massacre of the Jinnian camp. So I think these are and commemoration holds within it, uplifting the Palestinian narrative, thinking about in which ways we can talk about the narrative, in which ways we can talk about it critically. So when we talk about critical race theory, it's critical as well as race and confronting racism. So we are critical, we disagree, we think about where are are the women Ghassan can find this Leticia, the characters, and they are very important characters. From inside, there's tons of characters in the Ghassan Kanafani, but also the role of Palestinian women, including Jihani al who just came out with a, with a book, Fatima Bernawi, uh, Dalal al Mughradi. I mean, there is all of this stuff that kind of gets silenced as well, because there is an interest in the Zionist narrative to undermine the struggle, or the collective struggle of the Palestinians. And also to undermine the Palestinians and call us we backward, we're excessively homophobic, we're excessively sexist, and so on, exceptional but loving Palestine. And when we apply indivisibility of justice, to justice in for Palestine, we actually confront that and refuse pink washing, civilization washing, green washing, all sorts of washings and the ways to quote Israel as a Zionist, uh, uh, but that is actually failing. And I will stop. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry, Rabab. I think we really have to end here. There was just another very quick question. Just if anyone knows just the, the answer to this, there was, a question, there was just a comment about that one of the problems is that Kanafani's writings are difficult to obtain in terms of, uh, the, what's the question? The, the right to translate them is difficult to obtain. Does anyone know where to go for that? Actually, there is a lot. Now, if you go on the internet, there is tons of Ghassan Kenitani's writings that are available in PDF to download. And if people have hearing impairment, they can actually listen to them as well. So there is yeah. no, the, the right to translate. Yeah, right? I think, I think I, yeah, well, yeah, what Sam yeah. is saying is the right to translate. I mean, I wanted to, I don't know the exact answer. I would say, I did want to shout out, I, I when I talked about translations, I'm I love Barbara Barbara Har Harlow and her work, and we're all invited to her work. I was just saying uh, originally, kind of, there's always problems with things lost in translation, even the best translations, especially Arabic to English, in my opinion. Um, but uh, we are all we owe a great debt to Barbara Harlow and, and her work. Um, so yeah, I mean, her work is widely available. Her translations, luckily. And I think, Sam, your question is about new translations, like getting the right to do retranslations about that. And I don't, I think, Haidar, you'd probably know better. I mean, I know that the Kanafani Foundation and, and, and uh, Hassan's widow, any Kanafani kind of controls his estate. Um, and so it would, I think the, the most direct line would be to go through them. I have no idea how, you know, I know we had to talk to them to get the rights to adapt the play. Um, to adapt uh, returning to Haifa for the stage. So I'm sure that that's the most direct course to get the rights for translation. And I don't know how forthcoming they are with those rights. Maybe Haidar, you have uh, more insight into that. Um, and, and not really, no, no, I'm not, no, 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 not really, I really don't know. But I know that they're available. I know that they, you know, um, most of his works have been, uh, no, 
you can't hear me can you hear me no yeah oh sorry yeah um yeah most of his works yeah, have been it's translated it's putting and... up and on. no okay can, is it okay now or... yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. I, I don't know. And I think, yeah, the Hassan Kanafani Foundation can be contacted about, you know, um, translation rights. But um, um, you know, but, but you know, I just want to go back uh, to to the point about, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian women writers. I, I, actually, the names I mentioned, you know, were almost all the names that were mentioned in Hassan Kanafani's study resistance literature. And this is why they were, you know, most most of them were men. And most come from the you know 1948 uh, mm -hmm. area, and this uh, otherwise I agree I completely agree. The last novel, for example, I, re I reviewed, uh, you know, is, is um, Yara Hawari's novel, The Stone mm -hmm. House, and definitely mm -hmm. I've read all Susanna Balhawa's novels. And I I completely agree with every single word you've just said, uh, Sam, about that. So, so thank you. Uh, um, one I thing, think I think we should do uh, this as continue. a video next time. I think yes. we should do this next time about the whole question of the, the process of translation. What does it mean? This should be one of the questions we talk about. Okay, so what we will do, because there are a lot of other questions that we have, and I'm sorry we wouldn't get to them, um, but this was a very rich discuss discussion, very you know, thought-provoking, very relevant. Um, and uh, I think also about the, you know, the past and the present. I mean, our new generation continues to take this forward like PYF, PYF uh, Palestinian Youth Movement, others, and also, you know, through different forms of art like hip hop and like Ismail mentioned as well. Yes, there are a lot of questions, we didn't get to them. So we will be in touch, but us will be in touch with you. And um, we'll see if we can do something next week for about an hour or so. So thank you very, very much. Again, um, the, the, um, the video will be available, I think, on our Facebook and our website. And please continue to access our website and our uh, social media for updates because we do have our annual conference coming up. We do have uh, the Edward Said Memorial. We have several other activities coming up. Um, so, and thank you very, very much, all of you and our audience. Thank you very much. Bye.